It's a real privilege to be able to tell you about um, our work in histiocytosis and why we uh, spend so much time working on this fascinating disease. Um, I've only been in the world of histiocytosis research for about 10 years, but um, over and over again, I'm just uh, incredibly impressed by the dedication and the sense of purpose of the people who are involved in histiocytosis research. And I'm really pretty much in awe of the, the dedication, um, the selflessness of people who want to help out individuals, especially children who suffer with this disease, and the families who suffer right along with them. Um, obviously, finding new treatments, better treatments, cures for patients with histiocytosis is what keeps me in this field. But frankly, another thing that keeps me in this field is the dedication of those people around the world who understand this disease and care about the patients who suffer from it. So in this brief video, I want to tell you about uh, some of the work that we've done, and not so much concentrate on the science, but rather use this as an example of um, two really important aspects of histiocytosis research. The first is teamwork, and the second is the importance of uh, non-government private funding in order to get this work done. So I think one of the reasons I've been asked to um, talk in this video is because my group and I were lucky enough to find something that we think is very important in one type of histiocytosis and Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or LCH. And not only is the finding important, but it leads, uh, we think, to uh, what are undoubtedly going to be better treatments for this disease. Um, and the first point I want to make about this is the idea of teamwork. So let me back up for a second and tell you that what, what some of you who are watching this video may already know, which is that a lot of the reasons that, uh, a lot of the reason that we work in LCH is because fundamentally it is biologically a really, really interesting disease. Um, and there have been a variety of controversies that have plagued our understanding of this disease. This goes back to 1893 when Alfred Hand described the first child with LCH. In fact, Hand, some of you may know, is the Hand and Hanschuler Christian disease, one of the early names of this disease that eventually became LCH. And from that time, right up until about 2010, a debate raged about what this disease is. On the one hand, is it a, an inflammatory disease where there's just a ton of inflammation? Or is it more like a cancer, what those of us in the trade would call a neoplasm? So why is this, why is this an important question? Well, it's important because we want to know what causes LCH, what this disease is about. But it's also important because we can't treat this disease rationally until we understand what causes it. And the difference between these two ideas is pretty profound. If it's just an inflammatory disease, then the cells that make up histiocytosis and LCH are fundamentally normal cells, but they're responding to some inciting stimulus, a viral infection, uh, some kind of uh, irritant. And then our approach to treatment would be to get rid of the irritant and then tamp down the inflammation, kind of the way we do with other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. But if it's a neoplasm, then it falls into the paradigm that has been so successful in the past 10 years in treating certain kinds of cancer, the area that I know best. And the reason that's important is because we now know in cancer that it's caused by mutations or gene damage in genes that control cell growth. And when you come up with drugs that block the effects of those mutated genes, you can make many of these cancers melt away with very few side effects. So if LCH falls into that category, that's quite different from treating an inflammatory disease. So for the past 10 or 20 years, a lot of people have been trying to find genetic abnormalities in LCH. But there's been a problem. One problem is that the disease is rare. And in order to really understand the genetics of a disease, you need significant numbers of patients with tissue to, to, to analyze, and that's been difficult in a rare disease. The other problem is that most of our technologies for doing genetic analysis rely on tissues that are freshly isolated and then frozen right away. And there just isn't a whole lot of that in LCH. Instead, what we have to work with are the clinical tissues that we get as part of a biopsy or a surgical resection. And those tissues are preserved. They're preserved by soaking them in formaldehyde and embedding them in wax. That does a great job of preserving the architecture of the tissue. 
but it really screws up the DNA, and the DNA is what we need to look at in order to do genetic analysis. Nonetheless, we decided to put together a team of people to try to address this question. And on that team, we had clinicians who uh, knew about the patients and knew about their clinical history. We had pathologists who could find these preserved tissues and tell us where in the preserved tissue was the LCH. We uh, had a team of genetics experts, and this is critically important because at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where I work, we had a team of people whose job it was to figure out how to do genetic analysis in these preserved tissues. They weren't working on LCH, but they were very happy to partner with us when we made that offer. And then we needed a special kind of statistician, a bioinformatician, someone who could interpret the genetic results. And when we put that whole team together, we were able to find about 60 samples of LCH from two hospitals in Boston, just about the entire uh, component of LCH in Boston. And when we did our genetic analysis, we discovered that two-thirds of these patients had a genetic mutation, and it was all the same genetic mutation in their cancers. It was a mutation in a growth gene called BRAF, B-R-A-F. It's the same mutation that is found in many cancers. And in fact, one of the hottest stories in cancer this year is the treatment of patients with widespread skin cancer, melanoma, with a BRAF drug that makes the melanoma melt away. So this is a very important finding, we think, for at least two reasons. First, it pretty much settles the argument in our mind, this is a neoplasm, LCH is a neoplasm, but that turns out to be pretty good news because it also tells us there's a way to treat it. And several people in the histiocytosis community are putting together clinical trials to test BRAF inhibition in treating LCH. So that's the teamwork story. And I just wanna take another minute to tell you about the other part of this story which is the funding part. So we had the idea of putting together this team back in 2009. And 2009 was just around the time when the administration and Congress put together the uh, stimulus bill to try to pull the nation out of the Great Recession. So think what you will about the stimulus bill. For those of us working in biomedical research, this was great because the stimulus bill put hundreds of millions of dollars into biomedical research. So when we saw this opportunity, uh, we wrote a grant application to the National Institutes of Health, the major funder of biomedical research in the U.S., proposing to do what I just described. And some of you may know that when you write a grant application to the NIH, they call in a team of outside experts to evaluate this grant. They give it a score. And then the NIH will fund grants based on their scores, and they'll keep funding till they run out of money in a given year. So usually, in good years, something between 15 and 20% of grants get funded. So I wrote this application, and to my great surprise, I got the best score I've ever gotten in 30 years of being in this business. It was between the first and second percentile uh, in scoring. So all of us working on this project were feeling pretty good about things, and we sort of mentally had the money spent. And then I discovered that the director of the National Cancer Institute decided that this grant would not be funded. And the reason he thought it shouldn't be funded is because the disease is rare, the impact of our results would be too small to really justify the expense of funding this grant. There were some testy emails that went back and forth between me and the director of the National Cancer Institute, but he stood firm. So this is an interesting situation. Here we actually know the outcome of this grant. This would have been a great investment for the National Cancer Institute because we discovered something important in the disease. And so the message here is that without funding from private organizations, we couldn't have done this experiment. We couldn't have found the BRAF mutations, which I'm quite sure are gonna to lead to better outcomes for patients with LCH. And so it's no exaggeration to say that those of you who are looking at this video, those of you who have been, in, have been involved in raising money to treat the histiocytosis. Without your efforts, we wouldn't be able to make these critically important discoveries that are gonna improve the lives of patients with these diseases. 